Bonjour, Daniel. Bonjour. Pour en revenir à, à Rafa, tu t'es entraîné avec lui cette semaine. Comment tu l'as trouvé On dit qu'il est moins rapide, qu'il bouge moins bien, qu'il joue plus court. Enfin, on aimerait savoir, toi, ton impression, si on va avoir la meilleure version de Nadal cette année ou si c'est du passé maintenant. Franchement, il jouait bien. Euh, après, je n'ai pas plus à dire parce qu'on n'a pas non plus fait les 5-7, mais il jouait bien. Il jouait mieux de ce que j'ai vu à la télé, à Rome et Madrid. Euh, parce que moi, je n'avais pas trouvé que j'étais mauvais. Il m'a battu, on va dire, battu. On a fait un set et quelques. Et il jouait bien, donc euh, ça va être intéressant pour moi de voir comment il va être contre Zverev. Parce que, encore une fois, euh, Rafa, c'est toujours Rafa. Il a gagné 14 fois ici, jusqu'à ce qu'il joue ici. Même si on ne peut-être considère pas comme un favori, bah chaque match qu'il joue, il peut le gagner. Euh, et parce qu'il a gagné quoi Son ici a perdu 3, 4, je ne sais pas. Donc, euh, euh, ça va être intéressant le, le match. Comment vous avez senti si vous avez joué Rafa dans le premier round Qu'est-ce que vous pensez que votre réaction aurait été Bien, c'est un grand événement de jouer Rafa à Roland Garros. Um, but it's a tough draw, you know, this is a reality. I would even say, in a way, if you get him like third, fourth round, now that he doesn't have the ranking, it kind of feels normal that it could happen. Uh, and first round would be tough against someone who plays, uh, who won uh, 14 uh, titles here. Uh, but, you know, yeah, I think, I think it could be a very interesting match. Um, I practiced with Rafa yesterday and he played pretty well. Like I, I felt much better than what I saw on TV in Rome and Madrid. But again, practice and match is different. So I'm uh, going to be there watching uh, a big match. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not shy to say I'm happy it's not me playing against him first round. <laughs> Daniil, uh, Prajwal Hegde, Times of India. Sorry, this is another Rafa question. Uh, no problem. Uh, It's normal. <laughs> uh, can you describe what it is to play him? Well, it's it's first of all tough, you know. It's like same on practice yesterday. We laughed because sometimes about Rafa we tend because he's maybe I don't want to say the most hard working tennis player ever, but very hard working for sure. So a lot of hard work, a lot of mental effort. But sometimes people forget that he has a lot of talent in his hands also. It was like we were warming up serves and then he did like a, a three in a row volley drop shots, uh, banana once, you know, like with the backspin. And it was funny because uh, we were saying, yeah, no, no talent, just hard work. Uh, but uh, it's, it's tough to play him. He has uh, the capability to, to spin the ball, not like other players. So you get these high balls, especially on clay, is not easy. And then... Uh, We, we go to where he fights for every point, he brings intensity to every point, so you know you're going to be tired, you know it's going to be tough, and that's not easy. Yes, Daniel, a question for you. I've seen you have a place in your name in uh, Maison Lafitte. Do you think France uh, has <laughs> adopted you, or, and, and why? Yeah, that, uh, that was a very, uh, you know, a special occasion for me because uh, I know the president of the club since, uh, since the day I, I played their first match uh, for, for their club. It was my first match uh, for any club in France there. And we, uh, we kept the warm relationship with him. And uh, one um, year and a half ago, he came to me and he said that he had this idea where I played for the club. He wants to, to build a great uh, indoor, uh, indoor courts uh, and name them after me. I was like, I'm happy, you know, uh, if you, it's a big honor for me that uh, you ask me this. And I was happy to help with it and happy to, to be there. Um, was a really, uh, you know, fun, uh, fun event to, to take part of. You know, about France, I mean, I speak France, uh, I speak French, I have all the team that is f uh, French, so I think it's been already a long time that uh, I have a lot of French in me. Um, I'm still very far from being French, especially, I mean, the culture, the education is completely different. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I definitely have some parts in me. Hi, Daniel. Um, I know you've spoken recently about uh, your serve and how you feel like maybe the last couple of years you've sometimes been un unable to practice it. And I'm just wondering, have you accepted that that is now just going to be your situation for like maybe the rest of your career? Or is there still some hope that you'll get back to what it was in the past? Definitely didn't accept it. Um... 
And uh, yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's life of a tennis player. Tennis player is so many small details, adaptations, uh, sometimes with serve, sometimes forehand, backhand, your physical uh, condition, your mental condition, uh, the people around you, etc., etc. We could go on forever. So again, uh, yeah, that's the, uh, the honest part where last year, uh, 2023, I could practice it a lot till one moment where I couldn't do it anymore for some, let's say, physical problems. Uh, and for sure, the less you practice it, the tougher it is to come in the match and just repeat the movement. Uh, even if in the match I'm feeling much better than on practice all the time. So uh, actually here I was able to, to practice a lot this uh, couple of weeks because I've done a big job with my team to try to get rid of the problem I have. Um, and let's see if it helps. It, might not help like this straight away in the, in the span of two weeks, but I definitely didn't accept it, and I'm sure I will come back to the level of serve I, I can serve. Hi, Daniel. Just um, following up on that, was it the hernia operation that was the turning point for the serve? Again, same with tennis. You never know. I don't think so. Uh, well, not uh, uh, how to say. Um, directly, it didn't affect it, but indirectly, you know, for one, for two months, your uh, body, um, like, uh, you, you go a little bit like this, so you close a little bit, maybe it had some uh, short impact on my, uh, on my body, which then didn't recover, so direct, there was no impact, but indirectly, with tennis, you never know. It could be uh, one day you took, I don't know, heavy bottles of water from the shop and then something happened, or it could be hernia operation, you never know. Daniel, uh, how do you see the issue of uh, inequality between players? Even at such a level, some players have a lot, of, they have private jets, they have uh, better hotel equipment, staff and so on. Why are the players, especially those who come from qualifying, they sometimes they're traveling alone or just with their coach or their physical. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about this issue? You're, you're such a reflective player about uh, such issues. What are your thoughts about that? I'm really sorry. I didn't like. I got the uh, didn't get do, the do, actual question. How much does it? Do you think the the structure that a top player has helps him winning uh -huh. games against players who come, let's say, from qualifying? I think a lot uh, because, I mean, it's an advantage. Tennis is an individual sport. So whatever you do yourself or someone that helps you, it could be the federation, it could be your parents, it could be sponsors. Since your young age, whatever you invest and you do for your career, the people you choose, it helps. So the more money you have, the more people you can uh, choose in your team, the more it can help. Then it comes to the point where sometimes, you know, don't exaggerate it. Um, but, you know, every, I would say probably 95% of the top players we have right now, they probably were not uh, millionaires when they were young. They were not millionaires when they were playing Futures Challengers. Sometimes the Federation helped a little bit. So that's part of tennis journey that me personally, I think, is a fun one. Where you go, I was the same when I was uh, already getting in the top 100. Sometimes I was traveling without the coach because I was practicing in the academy. Didn't have a private coach. and. Uh, uh, then you go higher and you understand that actually this will help you. So if you're strong enough, you get into top 50, you have some money coming in, uh, you start uh, building your team, you go higher and higher. So for me, it's part of the tennis journey. Uh, it's just that the reality of tennis is also that to, to, to have the chance to become part of this journey, you need small help for somewhere since you were young, parents, federations or sponsors, yeah.